My name is Kelly Wallace, and at age eight, I testified against my paternal grandfather in court for his rape and molestation of me. When I was almost six, my parents decided to get divorced. My mom was intent on getting us as far away from my dad's side of the family as she possibly could. So she moved us to Salem, which is about a five hour drive from Milton Freewater. And she got a job working as a secretary in a women's prison. And um, so my mom was um, also newly sober and she was, you know, a single parent to myself and my sister and I was in first grade and my sister was two at that time. My dad was coming over from Eastern Oregon to pick my sister and I up for family visits. And my dad at that time was living with my paternal family. And it was during those visits that I was sleeping in the same bed as my grandfather. And it was completely normalized. Like it's completely normal for a six year old, a seven year old to sleep with their grandfather alone in bed. My grandmother was a nurse at an assisted living facility in the next town over, and she worked the swing shift. So she was not getting home until midnight. And so it was during the time that I was sleeping in bed with my grandfather that he was molesting me. There are at least two documented um, incidents in some police reports that were later, later filed. My second grade classroom my teacher had shown a child sexual abuse awareness video when i was about seven it was a video about good touch bad touch i saw this video in my second grade classroom and a light switch just kind of flicked on in my head and i realized that what was happening between my grandfather and i was not normal and i told my mom what was happening and that was it. My mom had known that in addition to, you know, this anxiety that I was experiencing in school, there were several other things that were kind of um, going wrong with me. I would come back from visits with my grandparents and I would look spaced out. I looked very neglected. I was talking about wanting to die by the time that I was nine. At that point, I was seven years old and um, suddenly it all made sense to her. So my mom, um, you know, really just jumped into action. She she called some friends. She called the police. Pretty soon detectives were coming over to my house interviewing me. I had a case manager from the Children's Services Division because my parents' divorce had been so contentious. That case manager um, happened to alert my dad, who was working as an assistant district attorney in the Umatilla County Court System. So my dad was tipped off that I had made these allegations. We suspect he took the day off of work and um, he went to my grandfather's house, summoned all of the relatives, and they met from like 5 p.m. to 1 a.m., you know, just various relatives kind of circulating in and out. And they came up with an alibi. And um, that alibi was that he could not have lost of me because he had been trampled by some cows. They were basically saying that there is just no physical way that this could have happened. And that just simply was not true. My recollection of the events was very solid. I was assigned a therapist and I was put into group counseling with other little girls like myself who were um, reporting that they had been molested as well. There was enough evidence for my grandfather to be charged with a count of rape and then another count of uh, child sexual abuse. A trial date was set, but what happened was um, my grandfather had spent $30,000, which at that time was a huge amount of money, to hire a legal team and they um, pushed the trial. So by the time that I got to testify, it, a full year had, had gone by. And so my memory was not as strong. Um, but a whole s series of events had kind of transpired in that year. So I found out that my dad had hired a polygraph examiner to do a polygraph exam with my grandfather in a, in a motel room in Pendleton in February 1985. He failed this exam spectacularly. My, my dad thought he was going to pass it with flying colors. And then in April, 
of that year when the original trial date was supposed to be set, my dad um, started showing up at my school unannounced. And back in those days, you could just, any parent could walk in and just strike up a conversation with a teacher. With You didn't have to check in at the front office. So my dad started talking to my principal, my teacher, my counselor, trying to get them to see his, his view of what happened. My mom pulled me out of school. I finished out the year at a private school. My dad had tried to show up at that private school and he was turned away, um, thankfully, by the director of that very small private school. But my what my dad was effectively doing, and he knew it as a prosecutor, was that he was trying to sway a witness. He was trying to badger me and um, get me to back down. And I was not backing down in my story because I just held so um, steadfast to what happened. I testified for about an hour and 45 minutes um, against my grandfather in court and my mom was not allowed in the courtroom with me. They um, had intentionally called my mother in as a witness, asked her four very basic questions. When you're called in as a witness in a trial, you can't be in the courtroom for the, for the duration of it. So um, very, very cruel tactics were used to keep me isolated away from my mother. And they had also um, painted my mother out to be like crazy. And um, they, they said that she was trying to coach me, which was just absolutely bonkers because um, that um, was just never happening. So I had meltdown after meltdown on um, the witness stand. I was eight and a half years old. And while I was being asked these very invasive questions by old men, <laughs> basically in a courtroom that was surrounded with um, my paternal relatives. They had packed the courthouse with my paternal relatives so that when um, a recess was called, I would have to walk past them out to my mother who was waiting outside the courtroom doors. And what we didn't know at that time was that there were two other women who had been interviewed by police and they were friends of one of my aunts and they um, initially said that my grandfather had, one said that he had touched her on the knee, another said that he had, I think maybe like, maybe grabbed her breast or so, something along those something along those lines. So my grandfather was a chaperone for both Future Farmers of America and 4-H. And so it was on these trips that he chaperoned. And my grandfather basically said that he wanted to sleep alone in in motel rooms with 12-year-old girls. That information was was um, not allowed to be admitted into evidence. So it, the, the trial was basically writing solely on my testimony. And um, those women were um, either paid off or something was something was done because they backed down and they they have not ever um, talked to me. I've reached out to them multiple times. I've tried to get them to, to engage with me and they have not. It was a three day trial. The jury debated and then they came back and decided that he was not guilty. I was devastated. I thought I failed. I just wanted my grandfather to go to jail. After that, my life resumed as quote unquote normal. I was in third grade at that time. I struggled in school. I was able to, you know, finish out my third grade year. And the following summer, my mom called the Umatella County Courthouse to try and get the court records of the trial. And she found out that not only was there my grandfather's trial, there was another trial. There was a civil lawsuit that my grandfather had filed um, with the help of my dad against the state of Oregon, my therapist, the social workers, the detectives, and it was a defamation lawsuit for a million dollars. My mom was able to get her hands on all of that court documentation. These two women that I talked about earlier, they were subpoenaed, they had to testify. So there's just lots of, there was just lots of documentation about, you know, their involvement. My dad's involvement was also, he was subpoenaed, he had to testify. And that's essentially where my mom was able to find out about, 
you know, this this meeting with the family where they had developed the alibi. When my mom had originally called to get the, the documentation from that, she was only able, because she was a single mom, she was in graduate school, she had no money. She was only able to get my testimony from that trial. And then she was able to get the full testimony from this civil suit. A few months later, she actually had some money and she called to see, she called the courthouse again to see if she could get the rest of the court documentation. The court clerk told her that they had been lost in a flood. I have lots of doubts around that. My mom graduated from special her, her college and then we, we moved to Roseburg, which is a town in Southern Oregon. I think it was during that time that my um, my dad had remarried and he had decided that he was going to file a custody lawsuit. When I initially disclosed that I was being molested, he what was what was relayed to my mom was that he believed me. And then he decided he switched. He decided he wasn't going to believe me. That was devastating to have your own father side with his dad who had been accused of of molesting me he should have been standing there with me there was like a, a creek that my um my dad would take my sister to you know feed these ducks and um when he came to pick her up i would hide i did not want anything to do with him i was so mad i was frightened absolutely frightened that I was going to have to potentially have to see my grandfather again. It was um, right before the custody filing that my sister had put been put into her own therapy because she was pulling little boys aside in her preschool trying to kiss them. And the preschool teacher was like, the hell is going on? This is not good. But she was put into therapy and it came out that my dad was molesting my sister. I'm fairly certain my sister saw what I went through and decided she did not want to go through what I went through. I mean, a police report was filed. The therapist was, you know, keeping detailed drawings my sister was making of what took place. My sister's, not to like compare, but my sister's abuse was much worse than mine. My sister decided one day that she was going to recant and which was which is unfortunate but at that time there was this whole like movement about false memories and to this day I believe my sister was molested and she claims to not have any memory of, of what happened but those drawings and um, the police report um, were used in this custody trial and my mom, you know, thankfully, she found someone um, who was willing to take it, and um, he he won. I was not at that trial. The way that he he was able to win the trial was just very, very like simple. My dad had brought in thirty character witnesses to vouch for my dad and like what a great dad he was, and they tried to make my mom out to be like this raging horrible basically who was an alcoholic and my mom had been in recovery from alcoholism for years and years at that point we didn't know this until later but the the judge also happened to be happened to be a recovering alcoholic and kind of saw through what my dad was doing you know trying to paint her to be this like horrible person so um we think that you know probably played a part and also the fact that my sister had made all, all these allegations. And so the judge in that trial ordered my dad to a polygraph. He ordered him to court supervise visits only. He ordered him to have what's called a penile facismograph, where basically your penis is hooked up to like this machine and you're shown child. I think it's like some 1980s like device of trying to determine if someone's a sex offender or not. And so they, he basically was able to use his legal clout to get out of, of taking this polygraph. And he did not ever take that, um, you know, facismograph. And he basically forfeited his right to have any contact with my sister and I after that point. He did not go through with any court supervised visits. He, um, chose his his legal career over my sister and I and at that point he had moved up from 
assistant district attorney in Umatilla County to district attorney. And then several years later in 1992, he became a judge in that county. Even though my mom and the attorney filed bar co complaints against my dad, the Oregon State Bar did nothing to stop any of this. My dad was a judge from 1992 to 2011, and um, he's still practicing law. After he lost, I was, you know, basically raised by my mom. I was just a very quiet kid, and we did, you know, my mom, we were just moving around a lot. My mom couldn't quite get settled in, like, where she wanted to live, and so it was really hard to, you know, establish friendships. My mom was basically alone um, because her family was all in Maine and Massachusetts. And so my mom was just, you know, bootstrapping it, um, single parenting. So I kind of was bouncing in and out of, you know, therapy, which I think, you know, was, was very beneficial in terms of, you know, emotional regulation because I never knew what any of my diagnoses were and I suspect at that time it was just anxiety but today you know I have PTSD as a result you know diagnosed by by a therapist in eighth grade my mom finally landed somewhere and uh, we landed in Salem again so from eighth grade to 12th grade I had one school that I went to school system I was just kind of like a B minus student I didn't have very good grades like I said I was very quiet I had no real way of advocating for myself within the classroom. I don't think I would have known, you know, what to do. Like, if I was confused about something, I didn't, you know, ask for clarification. I had gone to a writer's conference in um, Western Massachusetts when I was 16. And it was at that conference where I met all of these other kids from different backgrounds, like teenagers from different backgrounds. and. I decided at that time that I wanted to go to college on the East Coast. I wanted to get away from Oregon. Um, I got into the one that gave me the most scholarship money, which was a small women's college in the middle of nowhere in upstate New York. I became, you know, very outgoing, very social. I had all these different friend groups. I still wasn't doing all that great in college, but at least I was um, going to class and uh, turning in my papers and stuff. I was kind of, you know, surviving and, and doing doing what it took but I think I still had some you know some of that educational trauma I had great friendships but then I also discovered drinking it was like oh my gosh alcohol is amazing I can get out of my head I'm free but it wasn't long before I was um you know not doing well in my classes I was doing things that you know, I look back now and kind of horrified. I started smoking and I was like, oh my God, smoking is amazing. I also developed an eating disorder. I graduated um, from college with no real plan. Like my friends were like, I'm going to vet school or I'm uh, applying for med school. And, and I was like, I'm going to work at a coffee shop because that seems fun. And I just didn't, you know, I was 22, which I kind of can, you know, chalk up to like, who knows really what they want to do at 22. Um, I, I certainly did not. I kind of bounced around and um, was working all of these temp jobs, had real no real direction, still drinking. And then finally one day my mom was like, you, you need to get sober. And so I just showed up in an AA meeting one day in 2001 and um, uh, got sober. I like slowly just kind of built a life for myself. I got a permanent job, I got a car, um, I got an apartment, and I um, uh, became involved with this women's networking organization. And I started a chapter in Portland. I grew it to be the second largest in the United States and thought, oh wow, this is, um, I'm really entrepreneurial in a way that I never really knew before. And um, I had also started working as what's called a job developer, where um, I helped people with disabilities find jobs. And um, pretty soon I had my, my own contract with the state of Oregon. So um, that was when I was about 27, 28, 29. A friend of mine had been, you know, whispering in my ear for a really long time, like, you need to um, 
you should really, really, really think about writing, you know, this story, this experience that you had when you were a kid. And so I started taking classes um, and started working on this manuscript. It's not published yet. I'm working on finding an agent um, for it. And um, I started a podcast that's not out yet, but I started a podcast called Voices of Survivors where I interview other writers who have been victims of um, sexual assault. I got to chat with uh, Rowena Chu, who was a Harvey Weinstein assistant in January. There's a reporter right now who's working on the story and, you know, doing a lot of research into things like what happened to those trial documents. I developed um, a real interest in um, real estate investing. I found the therapist that I worked with when I was um, a child, when I was eight. She knew me from the trial. Yeah, I guess, you know, my life has kind of kind of come full circle. What I know, what has worked for me is, um, is therapy and outside support groups. And therapy is expensive. I think there's just, there's so many resources out there that are free um, through universities that have counseling programs. I just encourage people to get that in whatever form you can. But I also... Um, encourage people if they can't afford therapy is there are support groups there's um, I think there's Sexual Abuse Survivors Anonymous which I've never attended one of those meetings but it's survivors helping survivors and it's free and you know sometimes 12-step programs are not the, the bedrock of mental health but um, they are free and they offer support um, if there's nothing else I just I highly recommend getting support because it's such, it can be such an isolating experience um, because in many cases, the survivors are cut off from their families and have extremely damaged relationships as I can um, attest to.